We're in the heart of the New Forest to visit a place making a difference to the well-being of endangered animals from all around the world. Otters, wallabies, wolves and lynx, all animals that are helped by the work going on here. In our most ambitious broadcast yet, we're getting up close to the action to find out all there is to know about the lives that have been changed by the people that care. This is CCI TV in the New Forest Wildlife Park. Welcome to Wildlife Watch. Hello and welcome to Wildlife Watch here in the New Forest Wildlife Park. You join us live from the heart of the park, the perfect position to tell you all about this fantastic place. Yes, located just outside of Southampton, the New Forest Wildlife Park focuses on two main things, conservation and nature. Now, Josh, it's really sad to say that some of the animals here are actually on the International Union for the Conservation of Nature list, the IUCN Endangered Red List. But thanks to the amazing work that's done here, there is still hope for these animals. There is indeed. We've also got Lorena on the move presenter, taking us around the park and showing us some of our furry friends around as well. And we'll also take a look at all the behind the scenes action that goes on with the animal keepers at the park as well. And finally, we'll be seeing an endangered animal and all about their lives here. But before anything else, we are joined by the animal curator of the farm, Jason Palmer, who is responsible for all the ongoings at the park. Jason, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you for coming and speaking to us. Now, can you tell me, how did the park come about? Uh, the park's been running now for, well, since 1998. Uh, when the, the Heap family took it over. Um, it was running as a uh, British species, native species park. Didn't do too well. It was taken over by the Heaps and we've kind of expanded it and, and it's grown and yeah, we're, we're working on trying to help uh, educate and conserve and protect British and European native species. Fantastic, and obviously from being at the park there are a massive range and diversity of animals, but um, why is it that there are so many animals that are at risk of being endangered? Uh, one word, humans, people, unfortunately. Uh, most root causes of the, the, the issues with declining species and this, this mass extinction that we keep hearing about is people. People are expanding, habitat destruction, poaching, hunting, it all has an impact and effect on, on every single animal. It's awful to hear, but there are some really nice humans about, like yourselves, who actually yep. want to help. Yep. What is it that you and the other keepers do here? What do you get involved in? So the keepers and myself, we try and educate the public. We try and tell the public about the, the dangers animals face. We also do a lot of uh, wildlife rescue and rehab work here. So we'll take animals in that have been orphaned, abandoned, particularly owls and otters, deer, that sort of thing. Um, we'll help them recover, rehab them, and hopefully we can put them back to the wild. If they can't go back to the wild, then they, they stay with us and hopefully have a nice happy life with us here. Fantastic. You Fantastic were te work. telling us earlier that you actually take some animals home with you sometimes. Yeah, I've taken pine martins, otters, deer, hedgehogs, owls, all sorts of things home. If they need extra special care when they're really young, I get to take them home. Oh. And what was it that wanted, what was it about you that wanted to get into this? What attracted you to it? I've always liked animals ever since I was a little boy. Always wanted to be a zookeeper. Um, and fortunately, I've been lucky enough to sort of grow with my career and ended up here, which is amazing. It's so nice to be able to work with native British species, um, which are, you know, all around us or, and, and disappearing fast. We know that it's developed over the years from what the wildlife park initially was. Is there anything new coming up that we can look forward to? Yeah, we're constantly expanding. Uh, always new things. There, there is talk of getting us getting bears, um, which, which will be an amazing Ooh. thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we're, we're constantly looking to expand the, the range of species we have so we can showcase what, what uh, nature the UK has to offer and Europe as well. And like Aww. you said at the start, um, you know, the root of the problem with endangered animals is humans. But what is it that we as humans, as viewers, can can do to aid these animals, to help you, to help Yeah, them? I mean, we can all help, doesn't matter how small it is. Recycle your plastic, your paper. Recycling's a big thing at the moment. Do it, it's not hard to do. Yeah. If you've got a garden, leave a little bit wild. 
for the wildlife, for the bees, for the butterflies, for the hedgehogs. Um, yeah, don't sort of concrete over your drives, leave a little bit of grass, a few pots with flowers in, it'll help the bees, it'll help the insects, a few bird boxes up for nesting birds. You can do it at home, it's easy enough to do. Just takes a little bit of time and conscious thinking, doesn't it? Exactly, yeah. Environmentally conscious, I think it's something that we can all do. Absolutely, yeah. Helping save the planet and saving the animals, like your little friend here. Little hobbit here, yep, she's a bar now. She's about five years old and she's kind of an ambassador for her species. So we can take her out on the glove and she can meet school children and you don't really appreciate how beautiful they are until you get up close to them. And we have around 4,000 pairs left in the UK now. So not great numbers, they're, they're clinging on. Um, so people in, don't often get to see them in the wild, but if you can inspire a young kid to sort of look at that and, and you know, I want to protect it, I want to help it, yeah. it, it all helps. Amazing, Jason, thank you so much. You're welcome. Really thank interesting you. to hear all that. We're going to head over to Lauren, who is going to tell us all about some furry friends. Lauren, what's going on with you? Hi guys, you join me here at the otter enclosure where I'm talking to Tasha, who's going to tell us all about the otters that live here. You can also see our cameraman, Jake, who's trying to get up close to some of these otters to get some lovely footage for you. Tasha, who have you got with us today? So this is Jasper and Kodiak's enclosure, um, but only Jasper has decided to come out for some treats. <laughs> um, so he's just enjoying a little bit of fish as a little bit of a treat for the afternoon. <laughs> and they look very <laughs> <pretty>. <laughs> And he's now decided he would rather eat inside by the pool. <laughs> There's a bit of privacy, that's fair, I understand that. And where do these otters originate from? So these are North American river otters and they can mostly be found in Canada. Wow, not from the UK then. Are they likely to spend most of their life here at this park? So Jasper and Kojak, because they have been born in captivity, they will spend all their life in captivity. Um, but we do actually do rehabilitation okay. with our native Eurasian otters and we do release them back out. Great, some oh. good news. Oh, and, and now got... we have two. That's fantastic. <laughs> right on cue, here they are. And are all the otters you keep here the same species? No, so we've actually got four different types of otter here at the park. So we've got our smallest, our Asian short claws, to our medium size being our North American and our Eurasian, all the way up to our biggest type of otter, who are the biggest in the world, our giant otters. <laughs> and they're quite scary to look at. I saw them earlier. Yes. I noticed as well, you're feeding them from this bowl. What do they eat? So this is just fish, but most of our otters actually have a very varied diet. So fish, crustacean, even meats. The only ones who don't are our giants. <laughs> if it's not fish, it's not food, according to them. <laughs> so is it quite a difficult job to get them all fed? How often do you have to do that? We have to feed our otters three times a day. So they do end up with <laughs> breakfast, lunch and dinner. Good service here at the park. Do they all get along quite well together? Yeah, the only squabbles we have are over food. If someone has a piece that looks better, most of them want it. <laughs> I think that's happening right behind us here. They're going for that fish. And I have to ask, although it might be a difficult question, do you have a favourite otter? So I do. She is one of our Eurasian otters. And because she is partly hand reared, she is very, very cheeky. Aww. She has no fear of people. <laughs> so she has no issues whatsoever coming up and investigating what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit like this pair here. And, and from meeting Tasha, it's clear how vital the work of the animal keepers is at this park. We know on the surface what they do, but there is so much more to this job than meets the eye. We followed Chris Turner for the day to find out exactly what it takes to be an animal keeper. I'm Chris, I'm one of the zookeepers here at the New Forest Wildlife Park. My zookeeper journey started um, really last year. I wanted to work with zoo animals um, all my life, I've known that. So I did, went to university, um, I studied bioveterinary science um, and during that time I did an um, internship at Chester Zoo for one year. Um, and then after I graduated um, summer last year, I got a job at Battersea Park Children's Zoo. So that is one of the sister zoos to the zoo here. And I obviously must have made a good impression because uh, they asked me to be a permanent member here at the New Forest, which I gladly accepted. We do have a large variety of animals. They range from several different species of otter, Eurasian lynx, your grey wolf, and your common badger and fox. In terms of an average day, um, there's not really an average day, uh, anything can happen at any point. Um, if I had to break it down, it would be you just come in, you make sure your animals are normal, nothing abnormal going on, so you do a morning check, uh, you feed them in the morning. 
If you look over at the aquarium, we do have chicken out, so that is for the wolves. Uh, the wolves do get fed um, different type of things out throughout the week, so we do vary it. Um, just so happens to get them fed chicken today. And then we've got fish, so this is roach. Um, we do get different types of fish. Obviously, we're having so many different otters here. Um, we do go through an awful lot of fish, but we usually feed them roach, sometimes sprats, sometimes give them a salmon head. And then we do have some rabbit left over, so usually that gets fed to um, some of the smaller things um, once the lynx has had hair fill. And then we do have some one-day-old chicks. They go to otters, they go to wildcats, um, even the lynx gets to them occasionally, sometimes the wolves get occasionally, and owls get a lot of the, um, get a lot of the chicks as well. Um, but we do obviously get other stuff in and out for the animals. We do try and vary their diet and um, keep it nice and exciting for them. And then here we do set up talks. So we'll do talks throughout the day um, with the public. We'll interact with the public. And then again, carry on feeding throughout the day. We'll do a lot of cleaning. Um, obviously animals produce a lot of waste. Um, it can be quite a smelly job. It's quite a manual job. Um, so we do a lot of cleaning throughout the day. Um, but obviously, like I said, anything could happen at any time. You've got your vet days, so sometimes, um, unfortunately, some animals do need to go to the vet on occasion. I like to get involved with the vet. Obviously, my degree is in bioveterinary science. I've got a, a massive interest in the medical side of things. Uh, so uh, I like to watch the vet. So yeah, I absolutely love the job. I love doing what I do. Um, it's really rewarding. Um, they do say don't work with animals or children, but I decided to ignore that. Um, but I absolutely love what I do, um, I wouldn't change it. Um, coming in every day and seeing the animals, it's, it's a massive, amazing de-stress. It's something I've worked really hard for my entire life and it's really, I'm really happy that I've actually managed to get here where I am today. not know all that and all the work that goes into being an animal keeper at the park. Very impressive, isn't it? It is. Not a lot of people do, really. There's so much that goes on. Maybe you'll have to give it a go one day, Josh. Uh, maybe, maybe I will. <laughs> this park is actually packed full of animals and apparently throughout the year, more and more uh, mammals and birds are introduced to the park as well throughout the year. So it just gets bigger and bigger as, as time goes on, which is pretty yeah. impressive. As well as mammals and birds, though, they're now doing butterflies. Yes, so there's a butterfly house that we witnessed the other day, didn't we? We did, yeah. It was pretty toasty in there, but um, it is beautiful, like a tropical paradise, full of colour, full of vibrancy, but it is very, very warm. Yeah. Very warm. Remind me never to wear a coat or any <laughs> layers in there again. <laughs> no, we've kind of only got ourselves to blame for that, really. But yeah. to be honest, if the, um, if the butterflies are happy, I have to say I'm happy, but they are beautiful creatures, aren't they? Oh, you're such a softie, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if you want to be softies at home as well, you can adopt an animal from 6 to 12 months for as little as £15. And there is a whole range of animals, like we've seen here, we've spoken about them already, but there yeah. are so many different animals. We've already seen Hobbit the barn owl, uh, they've got otters, they've got deers, wolves, hedgehogs, wolves. Right behind us. Yeah, <laughs> I'd rather have a, a hedgehog in my house than a wolf, but you never know. Whatever You're a bit you nervy around animals, aren't you? <laughs> a little bit. A little, it depends what it is. It does depend what it is. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see the rest of them, to be honest. I know. And meet some later. And if you do choose to adopt an animal, they don't leave you empty-handed either. They do give you very, uh, various items, such as a framed photo of your adopted animal. They'll give you uh, your name will go up in the thank you board in the reception, so you'll be a part of the New Forest Wildlife Park history, uh, and you'll also receive your very own adoption pack as well. Yes, and your contribution will feed the animals and contribute to the welfare also. If you're interested in doing any of that that we've just spoken about, the contact details are online and can be seen just there. And if you're sat at home saying, this isn't for me, I don't want to adopt an animal, we all know an animal lover, so why not get an adoption as a gift? I certainly know a few myself. We're going to head to a <laughs> quick ad break, where after the break we're going, to be speaking, uh, we're going to be speaking to Lauren, who's going to show us some more furry friends and find out lots more about some endangered animals. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Wildlife Watch, the show dedicated to all of our favourite animals. Before the break, we spoke to Jason Palmer with Hobbit the Owl, and we found out lots about the life of an animal keeper at the park as well. Yes, and there's so much more to come, Josh. So we're going to be finding out how an animal is saved from being endangered, and also getting to hear some interesting facts about our furry, flying and fun friends. And speaking of furry and flying friends, we're going to head over <laughs> to Lauren, who is having a hoot of a time in the owl enclosure. And despite what you might have seen on Harry Potter, owls aren't just for sending mail to Hogwarts. 
They're also known as one of the wisest animals in the animal kingdom. I'm joined by Tasha again, so she can tell us a little bit more about these remarkable birds, including these two incredible owls behind us. Who are these? So these are our great grey owls. So we've got Malamute and Willow. So these guys are normally found in quite cold climates, so they, they are very, very fluffy. <laughs> and they're hiding in the corner at the moment, so you might not be able to see them. How many owls do you look after here all together? Uh, so it's about 10 different species, so yeah. we have about 50 owls. That's incredible, 50 owls. Are they yeah. all from the UK? No, so we've got some that are from the UK, but a lot of them are from elsewhere. Um, in terms of the different range of owls you have here, do they all have different needs and diets? Um, the diet, it's normally quite simple. You know, chicks, rodents, things like that. But it just depends on how big the owl is, depends on how much they get. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. And are they really as intelligent as their reputation suggests? No. Oh. <laughs> so unfortunately, that is a very much an old wives' tale. And it is due to the fact that their eyes actually take up 70% of their skull space, which of course doesn't leave that much space for brains. Oh dear. <laughs> so they are very difficult to train. Right, so you won't see any of these doing tricks? <laughs> Unfortunately not. The only one that we handle quite regularly is Hobbit, our barn owl. Right. Um, but we have to handle her every single day. And are they nocturnal or is that another myth? <laughs> another myth. So oh. some are, but some aren't. Normally you can tell when an owl is going to be active by the colour of their eyes. Oh. So ones with yellow eyes, like our great greys, mm -hmm. are more diurnal. If they've got orange eyes, mm -hmm. they're normally crepuscular, which is dawn and dusk. Right, okay, I'll have to look out for their <laughs> eyes in the future and try and remember which is yes. which. <laughs> and have you got a favourite owl? Probably our long-eared owl, Twill. Aww. So yes, so we've had her for about two years now, but she's just full of character. <laughs> very, very sweet. <laughs> Excellent. And they do seem such whimsical creatures. There are, however, a lot of concerns that some of these are unfortunately at risk of going on the endangered, endangered species list. Conservation parks like this one at the New Forest are doing all they can to preserve species that are endangered or are alarmingly close to being on the list. Let's look at how the New Forest protects these animals, giving them care and love and, most importantly, a life. So this is the fox enclosure and um, we do have two foxes in here. We've got Autumn and Copper. So they're both rescues. Being foxes, they like to dig a lot. So obviously it's a lot of a, a forestry type feel to it. Both our foxes are rescues from the RSPCA. Copper is the boy. He was found at an airport. Uh, so he was being hand fed by people and then the RSPCA rescued him and they deemed that he was too um, domesticated basically. Um, he's too used to humans and um, he couldn't be re-released back into the wild and the same thing happened with autumn so the idea of target training is that they'll touch the target i'll be able to hand them some food it'll get to the point where i'll be able to target them either inside their enclosure so that they can be shut in if the vet needs to see them and that will be done stress-free and um, they won't be um, stressed about that they'll be quite happy to do so here we go go on good boy He's a good boy. Autumn herself was very, very shy when I first started here. She would only really target for female members of staff. She would gradually target for me, but she wouldn't come anywhere near me to take her food. Copper was a lot more confident. He was quite happy to target from me straight away, even hand feeding pretty much from the get go. Over the past two months, Autumn's made massive, massive improvement. She's now very happy to hand feed from me. So she'll target and then she'll hand feed. Um, she's actually quite excited to see me on occasions when she comes in. Touch it. Touch it. You're so close. Good girl. Come on. There we go. For me, all my hard work has paid off. You have to be very patient when you're doing these type of training. So I feel absolutely over the moon that she's finally feel confident enough to come and hand feed from me. So the reason why we do train these animals, so usually if you've got a, like a troublesome animal, an animal which means um, has to go to the vet a lot or has to be seen by the vet. It can be quite stressful for them. Autumn does have some problems. She's got a bit of a limp. She's always had that since she arrived. So the idea of training is that they will quite happily um, in a stress-free environment come over and be seen by the vet. Here we go. Up here. Touch your target. Good girl. 
You can have that copper, go on. Good boy. Good boy. All gone. Well done, guys. See you tomorrow. See you later. As you can see from that VT, there are very many endangered animals at this wildlife park and we're lucky enough to have one with us right now. <laughs> we are well. fortunate again to be joined by Jason. Jason, thank you for joining us <laughs> and for, for arming me with Hobbit. Yes, very as unsure as she looks. As unsure as I look, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we're very lucky to be up close and personal with Hobbit. We can't do it without Lauren. Lauren, get in here. You have to meet Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I bet you're delighted to be holding Hobbit. Oh, <laughs> I've had so much fun meeting the otters, but I'm so happy to be this close to Hobbit now. Incredible. She is beautiful, Jason. Absolutely. How old is she? She's about five. Oh. She's quite young for a bar now. She could live up to 20, 25 years. I've always wondered with, with um, like wildlife parks like this, how is it, especially with birds, how is it that you get your hands on them? Because, not hands on them, but how, how, how is it? Is it easy to you know, get them? Yeah, in the good old days, obviously, everything was taken out in the wild. Um, things have changed a lot now. So Hobbit, she was bred by a private owl breeder. Um, we got her simply so we could do this with her. So we, she's, she's actually quite humanised. She comes with her own licence. She's got her own piece of paper, which makes it legal for me to keep her. <laughs> and most of the animals around the park that we have, and pretty much most animals in zoos have licensing and very strict regulations of how you obtain them and how you keep them. And um, you can't just keep them as pets. It's, it's mm. not a good idea. So she's, she's all legal and above board. Is that the case with, with all the animals here? That they... Most of them, yeah. It's, there's a whole range of licensing requirements. Um, the more critically endangered an animal is, the stricter the licensing and the movement. Mm. So we have to adhere to all those. And is it right she lived with you for a little while in your own home? Yeah, obviously <laughs> to get her used to people from a very young age, I, I, we needed to make sure she was okay with one person first, and that was me. She came home, she lived on the end of my sofa for a little while, Aww. got used to the dog, um, dog wasn't very impressed, and then we moved her into the keeper feed room and sat her on top of the fridge where she got used to the keepers and gradually increased her experience of people. So now, whether it's a very, very small, rowdy, noisy child or, or an adult, she's absolutely fine. Um, or even people that are really nervous with birds. She <laughs> you're so you're doing well. <laughs> Your poker face is good, eh? Hey? <laughs> she's only five, so will she get any bigger by the time she reaches 25? No, they're fully grown between 12, 14, 16 weeks. Um, and that's it, that's as big as they get. And that's the, the same with most birds. They, they have a rapid growth and because they need to, obviously, to get out of the way of predators and to survive. But that's as big as she'll get. She won't get into oh. that. She's oh. about, <laughs> about 300 grams. OK. Yeah. Not very heavy. So not too heavy. No. So I won't complain about it being heavy. <laughs> <laughs> you were nearly there. <laughs> I was going to say, it's such a privilege to be this close to an owl. We don't get this chance in the UK very often. No, barn owls are declining. Uh, the numbers are reasonably stable at the moment. I think there's about 4,000 pairs in the UK, but that's not a patch on what it should be and what mm. it was. Um, main reasons for the decline are lack of nesting habitat, um, rodent poison, <laughs> obviously they eat mice, oh, really? if, if they, they yeah. see a mouse and it's on the floor they will take it and if that, that rat or mouse is, is eating poison it mm -hmm. goes straight to the bird. And um, the other thing is the height they fly is actually the perfect height for a 4x4 four four or a lorry uh, windscreen. Oh, so a lot of them suffer from road traffic accidents because they fly sort of hedge, hedge line height. They just hit the car, a large car, 4x4 four four or a lorry and that's it. Yeah, and because she's quite light in her colour as well, with the sky being as grey as it has been recently, you probably wouldn't be able to see her very well. No, they're perfectly camouflaged, so they tend to hunt dawn and dusk. Um, so if you imagine a, a full, fairly sunny, grey, misty morning, that white underneath, if she's flying up there. Ooh! <laughs> if she's flying up there. Pop her back there. Um, <laughs> her prey won't be able to see her, and obviously that gold and that grey will blend into sort of a murky, misty morning. Um, or, or sunlight just coming up, it's perfectly camouflaged. It's sort of at, at the top end of uh, the predator range, I suppose. Very, very uniquely designed. Do you have a lot of them at the, at the park? And we've got one other one, which was a rescued pet. Um, a lot of our owls are rescued, um, but she's the only one really that we can get out and have on the, on the glove, as it were. Well, she's certainly a beautiful one to have out as well, with like the goldy specks. Yeah, it's very impressive. 
Is it usual to have different colour variations for owls? Uh, yeah, actually, that's a good, very good question. The barn owl is one of the most widely ranging or geographically spread owl around the world. So you can find them in Africa, North, South America, Australia, pretty much everywhere except Arctic and Antarctic. Okay. Um, and their colour phases, depending on where they live, obviously African savannah, slightly different to English woodland, their colours will be slightly different to sort of make sure they blend in perfectly with the surrounding area. Jason, thank you very much again You're for welcome. having us. Thank you for showing us the Hobbit, oh, not the Hobbit, for showing us <laughs> the Hobbit the owl. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. But that's all we have time for. We now understand all the hard work you do here at the Wildlife Park and I have to say the love and support you show these animals is incredible. Thank you. If there is anything you want to find out about the New Forest Wildlife Park, the information is online and you can see the information and details below. Yes, and that is all from us at CCI TV and Wildlife Watch, but it's certainly been a pleasure and we've learnt so much, we hope you have too. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye.